Hello everyone, myself Dr. Amit Kumar Singh, I am Associate Professor of Microbiology. Today I am going to discuss a very important topic that is Staphylococcus, which is very important as per PG exam is concerned and also in UG examination. So this video I think will help both the students who are preparing for the PG examinations and also to the, for the students who are uh, reading the second year subjects. So let's see. The word Staphylococcus is actually given by Sir Alexander Oxton. This word is actually comprised of two different Greek words. One is Staphyl and another is Cocos. The word Staphyl means bunch of grapes and the word Cocos means berries. So you can see that this word actually describes the arrangement or appearance of the bacteria whereas this word is actually describing the shape of the bacteria. So by knowing the name itself you can understand that it is actually saying that it is a round shaped bacteria with cluster arrangement. So in Staphylococcus there are two important species one is Staphylococcus aureus and another is Staphylococcus epidermidis. Today I am going to discuss in detail about Staphylococcus aureus and briefly about other Staphylococcus. So now all of you know that uh, Staphylococcus is a gram positive cocci. So this gram positive cocci is actually classified into two different families. One is micro cocaceae and another is strepto cocaceae. So this micro cocaceae family has got two genus. One is staphylococcus and another is micro cocus. And this Streptococcus cocosi family has got a single genus known as Streptococcus. Okay. So now we should know that how to differentiate between these two families as both of them are gram positive cocci. So we will see that what tests we can perform to differentiate these two and basically it is the basis of classification of Staphylococcus and Streptococcus both. Before that, I am going to tell you that how to differentiate between these two micrococcasi. So, the major difference between Staphylococcus and Micrococcus is that Staphylococcus is fermentative, whereas Micrococcus is oxidative. So, whenever we will do a fermentation test, we will find that Micrococcus is showing oxidative reaction whereas the Staphylococcus is showing fermentative reaction and a test which can be asked in your examination which is used to differentiate between Staphylococcus and Micrococcus is modified oxidase test okay and another method to differentiate between these two is Hughes and Lipson's oxidation fermentation test in which I already told you that Staphylococcus will show fermentative reaction and Micrococcus will show oxidative reaction. So now I will tell you how to differentiate between a Streptococcus and a Staphylococcus. Okay. Suppose if in a gram is staining, if you are seeing a gram of Streptococci, so first of all we will perform a catalase test. So, if the bacteria is showing a positive reaction, then that is Staphylococcus. And if it is showing a negative reaction, then it belongs to Streptococcus genes. Further, the Staphylococcus can further be categorized into two different categories on the basis of tests known as Coagulase test. So if coagulase test reaction is positive, so the most common species which is coagulase test positive is Staphylococcus 
or yes and if it is negative it is further classified in a group which is known as cones the full form of cones is coagulase negative streptococcus streptococcus can further be classified into three different categories on the basis of hemolysis shown in blood agar and the, there are three types of hemolysis alpha hemolysis beta hemolysis and gamma hemolysis or no hemolysis okay so now you understand if in exam you are getting a question that in gram is near it is showing gram positive okay and catalyst is positive then it will immediately exclude out the streptococcus and if it is again positive catalyst so what further test should be done to confirm the identification of streptococcus or yes is coagulase test but this is not the only bacteria which is showing coagulase positive reaction that i will discuss further in the video so now <coughs> i will focus into the virulence factors of staphylococcus so to understand the virulence factor let me draw a diagram for you and it is a cocci so it should be round in shape so so first of all i will draw this outer layer of the cell which is called as cell membrane fine then i will draw another layer which is peptide glycan layer outer to peptide glycan there is another layer and that is the capsule fine so now when we are talking about the virulence factor the first virulence factor which you have read already so to understand better i have drawn this diagram so the first virulence factor which is actually cell associated factors or cell associated means a part of cell so basically these cell associated factors are actually present in the cell wall the first cell associated factor is peptidoglycan and the second cell associated factor is which is present in this layer is the coic acid so peptide of glycan so what is the role of peptide of glycan in disease pathogenesis how it is becoming a virulence factor as we know that it is a part of cell walls it will provide cell uh, cell structure integrity along with rigidity of the cell but it also initiate the result release of inflammatory cytokines along with activation of complements so these are the two action of peptidoglycan that is initiates release of inflammatory cytokines and activates complement this tecoic acid the function of tecoic acid is adhesion of the bacterial cell to host cell and it plays an important role in pathogenesis by inhibiting complement mediated opsonization whereas the last cell associated factor that is capsule it is polysaccharide in nature this factor also inhibits 
also like this. So these are the three cellulose factors. First is catecholagen, second is nucleic acid, and third is capsule. Now there are cer certain cell surface protein or cell surface factor, which is present on the surface. So you can see here in this diagram. This is one. This is another. And there are certain others. So what is the first one? First one is basically protein A. The second one is clumping factor. Third one is collagen binding protein. Fourth is fibronectin binding protein. And the last one is elastin binding protein. But this is not the one. But these are the important ones. Okay. So what protein A do? Protein A is very important because it has got anti-phagocytic activity, anti-complementary activity, and chemotactic activity. Protein A has got another characteristic feature, which is very interesting and it is very helpful in uh, in diagnosing or detecting or identifying other bacteria. How it, it is doing? Let me explain. Protein A has a capability to bind with the FC terminal of antibody, especially IgG, except IgG3. And it will leave the FAB portion of antibody free to attach with a specific antigen. So what we can do, we can use the IgG antiserum, which is coated with protein A bearing staphylococcus, to find out the specific antigen present in a specimen. So we can use this as a tool to group streptococcal or as a tool to type gonococcus. So what is the basis for this? The basis for this, when a antibody or antiserum coated with protein A is bearing staphylococcus mixed with a specific antigen, it will lead to agglutination of this bacteria. So this is actually known as co-agglutination. Why co? Because agglutination is happening because of another antigen, not because of the same antigen. So this antibody is reacting with another antigen and this protein A bearing staphylococcus is getting agglutinated. So that is why it is called as co-agglutination. So this is the basis for streptococcal grouping and gonococcal typing. So now come to the clumping factor. So this clumping factor also known as bound coagulase. Bound coagulase or clumping factor that means, that means it will remain bound to the surface. That is why it is called as bound coagulase. It actually leads to formation of clumps when a suspension of staphylococcus is mixed with plasma. So this is the basis of slide coagulase test. Okay. So whenever you will get a, a question that which enzyme is responsible for slide coagulase test? They may give you answer option bound coagulase or they may give you option clumping factor. So you have to remember this. Okay. So these are that not that much important in pathogenesis, but these two factors are very much important. Now, other than this, there are certain excreted or secreted proteins or factors. So I will discuss them in detail because they are very much important. So the, secret, so the secreted proteins are basically of three different types which is secreted by the bacteria. One is enzyme, another 
other is toxins and invasions. So what are they? First, I'll list it out. Enzymes are coagulase enzyme, hyaluronidase enzyme, DNAs, heat stable thermonuclease and lipid hydrolase also known as lipases so these enzymes are actually important in initiation and spread of infection this will break down the connective tissue this will break down the dna this will break down the nuclear structure and this will break down the lipid structure. So this help in spread and initiation spread of disease. One more important which I am forgetting is staphylokinase enzyme. This also helps in initiation of the disease or infection. Coagulase. Why I am discussing this coagulase although I written it first later on because coagulase this coagulase enzyme is actually the basis for tube coagulase test previously i have told you that clumping factor is responsible for slight coagulase test and this coagulase which is a secreted enzyme is responsible for tube coagulase test it is also known as free coagulase. That was bound coagulase and this is free coagulase. Okay. So basically this free coagulase will bind with coagulase reacting protein present in plasma and converts fibrinogen into fibrin clot. Leads to coagulation of the plasma. So this is the principle of tube coagulase test. Okay. So now come to the toxin. Before discussing toxin, I wanted to tell you the other enzymes like DNA, staphylokinase, and uh, lipid hydrolase. These are present in Staphylococcus and Staphylococcus both. But despite of this, Staphylococcus causes primarily localized infection, whereas Streptococcus causes primarily disseminated infection. The reason behind this is that. The amount of tox enzymes produced by Staphylococcus is much less than Streptokinase. So that is why the lesions are much more disseminated in case of Streptococcus and much more localized in case of Staphylococcus. Okay. So now the toxins. There are several toxins. The important one are alpha toxin, also known as alpha hemolysin or lysin, beta toxin or beta hemolysin. Gamma hemolysin, delta hemolysin, enterotoxin, toxic shock syndrome toxin, and exfoliative toxin. So these are the list of toxins. So the alpha toxin is the most important toxin, okay? And it has got a characteristic feature that it will be inactivated at 60 to 70 degrees Celsius, but reactivated at 100 degrees Celsius. How is it possible? Because it is combined with an inactivator which gets inactivated or destroyed at 100 degrees Celsius but not at 60 70 degrees Celsius. So that is why the inactivator is inactivating it at 70 degrees Celsius but not inactivating at 100. So this is characteristic of alpha toxin. What it causes? It is basically leukocytic. It causes lysis of RBCs, especially the RBCs of rabbit and not sheep and human. It is cytotoxic and dermonecrotic and obviously it is lethal. The next one is beta hemolysin. Alpha toxin is the most important toxin of Staphylococcus aureus and it is actually 
has got a very characteristic feature because it got inactivated at 100 degrees Celsius. The alpha toxin is the most important toxin of Staphylococcus and it has got a characteristic feature that it got inactivated at 60 to 70 degrees Celsius but reactivated at 100. The reason behind that is it is combined with an inactivator at and at 60 to 70 degrees Celsius, this activator is not get destroyed. But at 100, it got destroyed. So that is why it got reactivated at 100, but inactivated at 60 to 70 degrees Celsius. And other functions of, or other reactions which we can say, which will be produced by alpha toxin in the body, is it is leukocytic, cytotoxic, Dermonecrotic and uh, it also lyses RBC mainly of rabbits but not of sheep and human. This beta hemolysin lyses sheep RBC and it exhibit a hot cold phenomenon. What is hot cold phenomenon? Hot cold phenomenon that this hemolysis is exhibited, it started at 37 degrees Celsius but exhibited only after chilling. Okay, so that is why it is called as hot cold phenomenon. Gamma hemolysin is basically a bicomponent toxin. It is formed by two components. Now coming to introtoxin. Introtoxin is actually responsible for staphylococcal food poisoning and the characteristic feature of staphylococcal food poisoning is that the disease presentation starts within one to six hour of consumption of food containing the preformed toxins. If the food doesn't contain preformed toxins, if it contains only the bacteria, then it will not cause the disease. To cause the food poisoning, it should possess the preformed toxins. Okay, so. Uh, and almost 50 to 60 percent strains of Staphylococcus aureus produces this toxin. And this toxin has got several antigenic types. Of this, most important antigenic type is A. Others are B, C1, C2, C3, D, E, G, and H. And uh, the food items which is responsible for Staphylococcus food poisonings are meat fish, milk and milk products. Although the disease, this is terrible food poisoning is self-limited and it results in a day or so. And the site of action is very important for introtoxin. The site of action of introtoxin is not gastrointestinal mucosa. It is actually the autonomic nervous system. So it acts on the vagus nerve or vomiting center of the brain and leads to nausea, vomiting, followed by diarrhea. So important point to note here that is staphylococcal food poisoning present, mainly present with vomiting, then diarrhea will occur. In some cases of food poisoning, diarrhea will be the first presentation. But in case of staphylococcal food poisoning, vomiting will be the first presentation. Okay. So now TSST, the full form is toxic shock syndrome toxin. Toxic shock syndrome toxin causes toxic shock syndrome, as the name suggests. And the presentation of toxic shock syndrome is uh, like the patient will have fever, will have rash, hypotension and multi-organ failure. And the type which or group which produces this toxin mainly is bacteriophage group 1. So the name of toxin itself is TSST1. Earlier, previously this TSST1 is known as introtoxin F. So you must have seen when I was telling the name of the antigenic types, I said A, B, C, D, E, G and H, not F. So this F is actually TSST1. But it's not like that. Introtoxin B and C can also cause TSS, TSST. Oh, TSS, not TSS, sorry. So what is that much important about these two toxins that they are causing that was severe disease. Not um, uh, that introtoxin induced food poisoning is not that much severe, but this TSST is very much severe. So it is because these two are super antigens. And what do super antigens do? A super antigen will bind to the class 2 MSC molecules and leads to stimulation of a large number of T cells 
which leads to dysregulated immune response and enormous release of cytokines, centralukins, 1 and 2, tumor necrosis factor and uh, interferon gamma leads to this florid manifestation of the disease. Okay, so, and this exfoliative tox toxin also known as ex exfoliating, it causes staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome, double S, double S. And this staphylococcal scalded uh, skin syndrome is a uh, may have a severe presentation or may have a mild presentation. If it is having a severe presentation in neonates, it is called as Ritter's disease. Ritter's disease. Whereas in adult, it is called as toxic epidermal necrolysis. And the mild presentation of this disease is pemphigus and bullus empiticum. Okay. So these are the toxins. Now, the last but not the least that is invasions and this is actually uh, one more important thing I forgot to tell you that all of you know that TSST TSST is produced by Staphylococcus and TSS is caused only by Staphylococcus but it's not like that TSS can also be caused by certain M types of Staphylococcus by genes so you should always remember this thing also that TSS is not only caused by Staphylococcus, it can also be caused by Staphylococcus. Okay. So now this invasion, only one invasion is there that is PVL. The name is Panton Valentine Leucosidium. It is basically pore forming protein and it has got two components. One is S and another is F component. So it is also a bicomponent. Previously I told you one bicomponent toxin that is gamma hemolysin. So this gamma hemolysin and this PVL that is Panton Valentine leucosidase is are called as synergo hymenotropic toxin. Synergo hymenotropic toxin. So basically what is the meaning of this term that these two are secreted proteins and these are not associated with each other. When a secreted non-associated proteins works together to cause a symptom or a syndrome or a disease, those toxins are called as synergohemotropic toxins. Okay. So example of synergohemotropic toxins are PVL and gamma hemolysin. PVL has got recently gained importance because of community acquired MRSA. What it is, I will discuss later in this video. So this is about the various factors of Staphylococcus aureus. Now come to the disease caused by Staphylococcus aureus. Diseases caused by Staphylococcus. As I previously told you, Staphylococcus characteristically cause localized pyogenic reasons. Okay. So let's see. First of all, I discuss the disease caused by the bacteria itself. So, let me draw a diagram, not be too much good. I'll try. Take it as, as a hand. So, if it is involving a skin and soft tissue, what it will cause? The list are huge, but you have to remember few of them like folliculitis, furuncles. And like folliculitis, furuncle, which is also known as boil, furuncle abscesses, particularly or especially breast abscess. And an important disease which actually resembles a fungal infection called as botryomycosis. The Staphylococcus aureus is a causative agent for botryomycosis. Now the second structure musculoskeletal system of the body The disease caused in this system by Staphylococcus 
important one are osteomyelitis, arthritis, most common joint involved is knee joint, and pyomyositis. Pyomyositis, the overall cause or the cause of tropical pyomyositis is staphylococcus aureus. But acute bacterial myositis or primary myositis is caused by group based streptococcus, not by staphylococcus. So the question is about tropical pyomyositis or overall pyomyositis, the causative agent is staphylococcus aureus. If it is about acute bacterial pyomyositis or primary myositis, it is the answer should be streptococcus. Group is focus. Now coming to the respiratory system. In the respiratory system, it will cause tonsillitis, pharyngitis, sinusitis. In lung, it will cause bronchopneumonia and potent disease in neonates that is pneumatosis okay and in <coughs> cns it will cause abscess and meningitis fine and in endovascular system it will cause bacteremia pyemia septicemia and endocarditis I will discuss in detail because endocarditis is very important as PG exam is concerned. So the causes of endocarditis, different types of endocarditis are like this. Native wall endocarditis. Native wall endocarditis is the overall most common cause is staphylococcus aureus and it is also an important cause of hospital acquired native valve endocarditis but community acquired native valve endocarditis the commonest cause is viridans streptococcus Second endocarditis type of endocarditis is prosthetic wall endocarditis. Again, it is divided into two types early and late. Early means less than 12 months. The commonest cause for this is not a staphylococcus, it is staphylococcus AP. Dermitis. Whereas for late, more than 12 months, the cause positive agent is viridans streptococcus. Overall, the positive agent, if the question doesn't mention early or late, then the answer should be staphylococcus epidermitis. And endocarditis. IV drug users again it is it may be right sided it may be left sided so if it is right sided then the positive agent is staphylococcus aureus if it is left sided endococcus followed by staphylococcus aureus overall again staphylococcus aureus Subacute endocarditis is mainly caused by viridans streptococcus. Okay, so you must remember the causative agent of different type of endocarditis, right? So now these are all the disease caused by staphylococcus. One which is actually not seems to be very much important, but it is very much important. That is UTI. 
although staphylococcus is not a common cause of UTI, but if in a culture, even if single colony is grown, then that should be considered significant and should be reported and the treatment should be taken. Because urinary tract is not a common site of infection for staphylococcus. So if there is an infection, it should be treated. So now, now come to the lab diagnosis of the infection caused by staphylococcus. So to do the diagnosis of the infection, whether it is caused by staphylococcus or not, the first step is direct examination of the smear prepared from the specimen. Suppose if a first sample is received, so what we will see in the direct smear examination, we will see gram positive cocci in clusters along with fossils. Next what we can do is culture. Good thing about Staphylococcus aureus is that it can grow in ordinary medium. So it can grow in nutrient agar. In nutrient agar it will show a golden yellow pigmented colonies. This golden yellow pigmented colony is because of pigment beta carotene. Sorry, carotene. Beta carotene. And because of this golden yellow pigment, the name is aureus. Aureus stands for gold. So the name is Staphylococcus aureus is because of the pigment produced by the colony. Okay. And this pigment production can be enhanced by adding glycerol monoacetate in the medium. Okay. It can also be grown in blood agar and when it grown in blood agar as we know it has got several toxins that, is, that are hemolysins so it will cause hemolysis of blood. Okay. So it will show beta hemolysis. Fine. And to enhance the hemolysis, the culture media can be incubated under 20 to 25 percent carbon dioxide. These are all questions for PG exams. Okay? And there are certain selective media to identify staphylococcus, such as MSA, the full form is mannitol salt agar, in which it will show a yellow colony because of fermentation of mannitol. Other mediums are 10% salt agar and a specific media Lud Lamps medium. Okay? So by using these media we can do the culture of specimen containing staphylococcus aureus. Okay? To further identify, we have to perform certain biochemical tests. So what will be the biochemical reactions for staphylococcus? Already we know it is catalase positive, cognase positive, but then it is both slide and tube cognase positive. Other bacteria which are slide and tube cognase positive, both slide and tube cognase positive are staphylococcus, both slide and tube, staphylococcus Hycus and Staphylococcus intermedius. Only slight tube, slight test positive is Staphylococcus leucdunensis, and only tube cognates test positive is Staphylococcus schwefli. Okay. So these are the examples which I have told you earlier that Staphylococcus aureus is not only which is cognate positive. There are certain other bacteria from the same species which are the same genus which are cognate positive. Okay, fine. So other biochemical tests that people liquefy gelatin, MR and VP test is positive, indole is negative, and DNA is stable thermonuclease phosphatase tests are positive because they contain these enzymes. Okay, 
so <coughs> now it is identified now we have to type the bacteria to type the bacteria the method uses fast typing the method uses fast typing by using bacteriophage the national reference center for doing staphylococcal fast typing is at molana azad medical college new delhi that is mams in delhi and the epidemic strain of staphylococcal the fast type is most common fast type is at at1 okay so you may get this question in exam that which fast type is of staphylococcus aureus is much prevalent that is at at1 okay so now coming to the treatment of staphylococcal infection earlier when there was no resistance the treatment of choice was benzyl penicillin if the bacteria is resistant to benzyl penicillin then the drug of choice is nephrisilin or oxacillin maybe troxacillin if it is resistant to these antibiotics then the drug of choice is vancomycin if it is resistant to these antibiotic also then the drug of choice may be linozolid may be ticoplanin may be quinipristine dalfopristine so over time this antibiotics are no more working on these bacteria because of the development of resistance and this development of resistance is mainly because of overuse or irrational use of antibiotics in healthcare settings so now you can see this benzyl penicillin it is resistant if it is resistant then nephrisin also can be given how it become resistant what is the mechanism behind the resistance to benzyl penicillin so it is because of production of an enzyme called as beta lactamase by the bacteria what this beta lactamase will do obviously it will destroy the beta lactam ring beta lactam ring is present in the beta lactam antibiotics such as penicillin cephalosporin that is why this benzyl penicillin will not be useful in a patient suffering from a bacteria which is producing beta lactamase this beta lactamase enzyme is actually plasmid mediated and the mechanism of transfer of beta lactamase enzyme is through transduction okay and this nephrisin oxacillin you can see these are also resistant in certain bacteria they are not working so the mechanism behind this resistance is alteration in penicillin binding protein what is this penicillin binding protein that is it actually it means to say that there will be a, a change in the protein which actually binds with the penicillin in the bacteria so it will change the bacteria will change the protein itself how the bacteria is changing and why the bacteria needs a penicillin binding protein so basically this penicillin binding protein is nothing else it is trans peptidase enzyme and this trans peptidase enzyme you must be knowing that it helps in synthesis of sebo by cross linking the nag and na okay so this enzyme is actually known as penicillin binding protein because penicillin will bind with this enzyme and inhibits the cell wall synthesis and destroy the bacteria so if the bacteria will alter the structure of penicillin binding protein then penicillin will not bind with it and that bacteria will resist to that antibiotic so because of that because of this alteration of penicillin binding protein bacteria is resistant to most of the penicillins okay so usually in a normal bacteria which is not resistant to these antibiotics will have 
four different form of pencil manic protein one two three and four and the bacteria which is resistant to these antibiotics will have an altered pbp which is known as pbp 2a okay so pbp 2a is the reason behind that the bacteria will not be affected by penicillin because it will not bind with the penicillin penicillin will inactivate the already present proteins but will not inactivate this pbp 2a so this resistant mechanism or the bacteria which is having this mechanism are called as methicillin resistant staphylococcus or yes in short mrsa so mrsa bacteria will contain an additional pbp that is pbp 2a so this pbp 2a is actually mediated by mic a g and this mic a g is present in a mobile genetic element called as scc mic what is scc is staphylococcus chromosomal cassette so obviously this is chromosomal coded gene okay this is plasmid mediated this is chromosomal coded okay so this ssa mec has got several types 1 2 3 4 5 6 on the basis of the types or on the basis of the occurrence of the disease mrsa is further classified into two types CAMRSA and HAMRSA. What is CA? What is HA? CA is community acquired MRSA and HA is hospital acquired MRSA. So SSC, SSC make type which is causing CAMRSA are four, five, and six. Whereas SSC make type which is causing HAMRSA are one, two, and three. Okay. And the CAMRSA seems to be from community but these are more virulent whereas the chmrsa are less virulent but as it is from community it is less drug resistant and this is multi drug resistant if you remember when i told you about the virulence factor i told you that pvl has gained its gained its importance because of its association with cmrsa so cmrsa strains will produce pvl whereas hmrsa will not produce pvl and the infection in cv cmrsa will have features like necrotizing facilities due to invasive infection of skin and soft tissue whereas hmrsa will cause perioperative wound infections okay so this is about cmrsa and hmrsa and one more oxacillin uh, uh, resistant staphylococcus aureus known as borsa borsa is nothing borderline oxacillin resistant staphylococcus aureus this is not because of altered pbp it is because of hyper production of beta lactams okay even though it seems to be similar to MRSA. It is not similar to MRSA. It is associated with beta lactam production. Okay. So now, how to detect MRSA? There are several ways. In brief, one method is disc diffusion method, in which we will use sifoxetin, which is which is an antibiotic. This thirty microgram. or we may use oxacillin 1 microgram but this is not recommended nowadays only if for the 30 microgram disc is recommended to detect methicillin resistance another method is by using a oxacillin screen agar media which contains 6 microgram per ml of oxacillin to detect beta lactamases there is there are methods first method this is for mrsa and this is for beta lactamases for beta lactamases the method is 
penicillin zone edge test and another one is nitrosephin based test okay so these are all the tests which is which can be done to detect the resistance to the antibiotics first one is this diffusion test using cefoxetin this oxetin this here we will see the diameter of the zone of inhibition if the diameter more than 21 it is considered as sensitive less than 20 considered resistant oxetin screen agar we will see the growth okay and penicillin zone is test to detect beta lactamase production if there is sharp zone edge zone of inhibition at those sharp edges like cliff then it is positive if it is fuzzy then it is negative and in nitrosephine based test if it change the color from yellow to pink of the media then it is positive otherwise it is negative so these are the tests to determine the various mechanism of resistance okay so now what is the treatment of MRSA as we can see the drug of choice for MRSA is vancomycin other drugs are linozolid quinipristine, dalfopristine ecoplanin, deptomycin and also for skin infection topical ointment of nuporosin 2% can also be used all beta lactam antibiotics should be avoided but the few generations of phytosporin like ceftaroline or ceftibiparol can be used to treat MRSA so this is the treatment of MRSA now another entity you can see is resistant to vancomycin that is also known as VRSA or vancomycin resistant streptococcus. There is another form of vancomycin resistant called as VISA. In short, you can see this visa. It is vancomycin intermediate streptococcus. This is actually a high level resistance in which the MIC is more than 16 microgram per ml, whereas it is a low level resistance where MIC is 4 to 8 microgram per ml. There is another terminology called as heterogeneous vancomycin intermediate staphylococcus aureus this is an initial form of visa heterogeneous means some of the strain will be resistant and some of the strain will be sensitive to vancomycin when it will become visa all of the strain will become resistant to vancomycin ok so now coming to the mode of transmission of infection caused by staphylococcus. The most commonest way of transmission of staphylococcus infection is through hands of healthcare workers. That means it should be present or the most common site of colonization for staphylococcus should be skin. But along with the skin, the commonest site of colonization is anterior, nares, and skin of axilla, perineum, and groins. And what should be the effective mode of prevention of this transmission? Obviously, when I am saying it is transmitting through hands of healthcare worker, so the best way to prevent this is hand washing. And what if a healthcare worker is actually colonized with staphylococcus? How to treat? The treatment is application of 2% mucosin ointment for 5 days. And then it should be cultured again to see the presence of MRSA. If it is not present, then fine. If it is present again, it should be applied for next 5 days. Okay. So this is the treatment of Nasal colonization of Staphylococcus aureus. Okay, so lastly, I have taught you about Staphylococcus aureus, but we should not forget Coglase negative Staphylococcus aureus. So the important Coglase negative Staphylococcus aureus is Staphylococcus epidermidis. You have seen that it is the commonest cause of prosthetic valve endocarditis. Along with causing prosthetic valve endocarditis, it causes ventricular shirt infection and stitch abscesses. And one more important Staphylococcus is Staphylococcus saprophyticus. This Staphylococcus saprophyticus 
is actually a cause of UTI in young sexually active women. And the simplest method to detect whether it is whether the staphylococcus grown in a culture media is staphylococcus or not is by doing sensitivity testing by using an antibiotic called as novo biosin. Saprophyticus is resistant to novo biosin. Rest all cognizing with staphylococcus are sensitive to novo biosin. So I hope that in this video you will be able to gain some new knowledge, you will, you will be able to understand the previous concepts and it will help you in know, the examinations. All the best. Thank you.